So, you've created the outline for your fantasy world. Now it's time to fill it in with some features, some mountains, rivers, seas, volcanoes. We want it to fit in with the geography of our world and follow our rules. So we need it to be realistic. Or do we? I am McClellan Moorwood and this is The Fantasy Workbench. Okay, to start with, let's assume that we do want to follow the established geography and physics of our reality, our world, and make sure that our physical features are following the rules of what they do here. Okay, so let's start with some mountains. Good fantasy maps can always benefit from a little bit of a uh, little bit of variety, a little bit of uh, up and down. So let's start off with mountains. So in real life, mountains form in ranges. We don't tend to get what we get called lonely mountains. More on that later. Mountains always seem to form in in chains, in ranges, and in our world, they very, very often form in a north to south range. That's mostly because of something called plate tectonics, which we're going to be talking about in a moment, where the two plates come together and push the world up. So any mountain range that you're going to be designing, if you want it to follow that pattern, you need to be thinking about it in a mostly north to south um, orientation. A famous example that we can use of that is Tolkien's Middle Earth map, where we can see the main and most famous chain, the Misty Mountains, running from north to south. There are, of course, um, exceptions to this, but most long chains do run in that north to south orientation. The next thing that I'd like to think about are bodies of water, specific, mostly rivers. Rivers in our world follow one key principle. They flow from an area of upland downhill to eventually meet the sea. They don't flow from sea to sea, so we don't ever see any rivers that cut all the way across the landmass from one side to the other. They run from normally starting in uh, snow melt or springs in mountains, uh, all the way down eventually to empty into a sea or into a larger river. Another rule that I want us to be following is going to be the fact that rivers don't split. So when two rivers join together to make a larger one, that is called a confluence. That is where you've got two rivers forming a larger river, normally two different sources or more that have eventually flown into the same place and they create that larger body of water. The same does not work in the opposite direction. It's very, very rare in real life to have a river naturally split into smaller rivers. So if you've got your river on your map and it suddenly splits off to make two other rivers, very rarely does that happen in real life. The obvious example, of course, is a delta where the river meets the sea. Now, in actual fact, a delta is not a river splitting into smaller rivers and streams. It is, in fact, where the river slows down as it's meeting the, the sea. And all of the silt and sediment that that river's been carrying gets dumped because it slows down. And that creates smaller islands and deposits of debris, um, which, make, which gives it the appearance of being split into smaller streams. But actually, it's not. It's just the same widening of the river split up by smaller bits of land. And now for the bit that I enjoy talking about, volcanoes. I personally, in my uh, fantasy map for the Phantasm Chronicles, The Call of the Cardinal, I didn't put a volcano on mine, but I've got some own personal headcanon about one of, one of the mountains um, in my world that might be an extinct volcano, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. I told you that I was going to circle back round to that idea of the lonely mountain. Now, of course, 
the most famous example of a lonely mountain we'll go back to uh, who could be considered the the father of high fantasy Tolkien and his lonely mountain from the Hobbit in real life it's very rare that you get mountains standing by themselves if they are there it is very very likely that at some point in their lives they have been volcanoes a volcano in your world offers some really unique settings, a little bit of drama, uh, ha it heightens the stakes at times, or it might just be an amazing backdrop to add a little bit of extra lore and history to your world. If you're going to be including a volcano and you're going to be wanting to describe it, it's important to know of the two different main types of volcanoes. The first type of volcano which you can get is a shield volcano. Uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii is a really famous example of a shield volcano. And this occurs when plate tectonics, I told you we'd come back to that, they come apart and create a gap in the crust for all of the magma to come through. And eventually it forms a volcano from all of that lava erupting, setting, more lava erupting, setting again. Now, a shield volcano is made from uh, magma or lava once it comes out of the earth that's very runny. It doesn't create those big explosive eruptions that are very dramatic in films. Um, and because it's runny, it can run a lot further. So in your story, if you're going to want to have a volcano where the lava flows for miles and miles and maybe there's some sort of exciting uh, fleeing from that eruption uh, before the lava gets to the settlement or to your main characters you might want to make it a shield volcano that is the lava that flows the furthest because it flows the furthest it doesn't stick to the side of the volcano as much which means that shield volcanoes are always um uh, they're not very steep they've got uh, quite low edges the other type of volcano that you might decide to have is what's called a composite volcano, sometimes called a stratovolcano. That is almost the opposite to a shield volcano. That is the one that, if you were to look at a child's drawing of a volcano, this would probably be the one. Very steep edges, lots and lots of explosive lava shooting out of it. Um, you often get ash clouds with uh, composite volcanoes. And that is because they are created at what's called destructive plate boundaries, where two plates um, come together and one of them is pushed underneath. The um, material that that plate that's been pushed underneath is made of melts with the heat and the pressure and that creates a very viscous, sticky, thick uh, magma. So that when the eruption occurs, it's very, very explosive, very volatile. And because it's sticky, it does not flow very far, meaning that the edges of the volcano, when it sets on there, are very, very steep. If you want to have a very climactic, very dramatic eruption to a volcano, it's going to probably be a composite volcano. And why, why is this important? Why do you need to know? Because... Like I've just said, composite volcanoes are created by a destructive plate boundary where plates have come together. And if you remember from the beginning of the video, we talked about that's how mountain ranges are formed as well. So if you're going to have a volcano which is part of a mountain range or close by a mountain range, the chances are that it will be one of these composite volcanoes. Shield volcanoes are very often by themselves, very often on islands. It's very often that the island itself is actually a shield volcano which has formed underwater and eventually built up and up and up until it's poking out of the water and forms an island. So, let's have a go at adding some of those features to our map. So here we have our island outline that we created in the last episode. And the first thing that draws my attention is this island here and this little chain of islands here as well. Now, I think that that would be the perfect place for a volcano. Now, like I said earlier, normally it would be shield volcanoes that you would find in the ocean. Volcanoes that have been created by 
uh, tectonic plates split, uh, separating and they've formed over time. But I actually think that this would be perfect for a um, composite volcano. When Krakatoa erupted in 1883, which was considered one of the most destructive volcanic eruptions in human history, um, it actually destroyed so much of the island that all that was left was a portion of it and lots of smaller islands, which I think that this looks fantastic. This could almost be um, the remnants of part of the mainland that there's been some sort of catastrophic explosion at some point in history uh, from a composite volcano and this is all that's left. So I think that I would like this to be a volcano. I'm not going to write on that yet because I'm not going to be putting any labels on today, but I think that's what I'd like it to be. Now, as you can remember from last, uh, from what I was saying earlier, wh uh, we normally get composite volcanoes as part of uh, ranges, or at least close to a range because it's those destructive boundaries. So I would really like to have some mountains coming up here along the coast like this it's very often that mountain ranges do go along a coastline if you think of the Andes in South America and that's because you'll have an oceanic uh, plate meeting a continental plate and the land is shifted upwards, forced upwards to create this mountain range and of course also uh, a volcano in this context. We can see here that there's bays and inlets where possibly the mountain range would have continued at some point but possibly the eruption, possibly something else has caused uh, that mountain range to be split apart. So I really, really like that. I think what else I'm going to do as well is I'm going to add some extra mountains. Maybe not quite as, uh, as sheer there. I want them to go down the middle. So maybe I might round the tops of them slightly. They are still mountainous, but maybe not quite as sheer. They're definitely not hills though, and they're not quite as tightly packed. Maybe something like, maybe something like that. The reason I'm doing that is I would really like a source for a river or multiple sources. So we might decide, I might put another mountain there. We might decide to have a river that starts coming down here and we need it to twist and turn and meander is the scientific term. I want to have another source as well that comes and joins at a confluence. Remember we said that rivers can join, but they don't necessarily split. And it's going to meander slowly down to here. And remember what I said about deltas. Now, I don't actually have a rubber. If I did, I'd be rubbing this part of the land out. Because I'm going to create a delta there. Just like the Nile Delta that's emptying out into the sea. This is the sort of area, when we look next week, that you're very likely to find some sort of civilization around because this is where the water slows. This is where a lot of sediment gets dropped. It's a good place uh, for farming, for agriculture. So we'll definitely be seeing some sort of settlements here or along the river itself. Think of the Nile in Egypt. That entire ancient civilization was based around the Nile and it was completely hugging that river. If you went further out into the desert, there wasn't much at all. Okay, so we've got our mountains, our river, our volcano. What else do we think that we need to have? So I might decide that I want to have some form of forest. Now, of course, we need to be considering whether we want a deciduous forest or a coniferous forest, deciduous forest, of course, being um, forests of trees which uh, change with the seasons, that lose their leaves in autumn and winter, uh, they change colour, they regain them again in the springtime, and a coniferous forest being uh, like an evergreen tree, almost like a Christmas tree, 
that stays green all year round and they tend to have uh, needles rather than leaves. So you need to decide what you're going to have and it's going to depend on the temperature. In my map of the Cloven Empire for the Phantasm Chronicles, I work on a principle of the further south you go, the warmer it becomes. My map doesn't extend to the point of a whole globe, so I haven't included anything like an equator, but that's a basic principle that you could go off. And we could go on so something similar here. I think just because it's something that I know, I think I'm going to do that, but you change it up. It can be any... Um, type of weather pattern that you fancy. So I think that I'm going to have some form of um, deciduous forest on this little uh, peninsula. Just doing it very quickly. Um, it would make sense for this area to be quite wooded uh, maybe it's an area that hasn't been uh, settled quite as much or it could be an area for a civilization of maybe a race or a group of people that uh, like to be part of nature, that like to live in the forest. So that's an interesting area to have. And I think in the north, I think I'm going to create a nice big thick coniferous forest, almost like a natural barrier between the lands to the north and our land, which we still need to come up with a name for. I'll be very, very interested if you have any ideas of what you'd like the name of our world to be. If you could drop those down in the comments and uh, we'll see what, uh, what people come up with. But I like the idea of there being some sort of natural barrier. It's going to hinder that journeying further north and if any of your characters do need to venture off the map into other lands or other worlds it's just adding an extra difficulty there i could add in some extra ones but i think that that's probably quite good um the way that mountain ranges work is um you normally get one side of a mountain range which is quite dry and arid and then you'll get another side which is quite damp um, with lots of vegetation. Uh, and that is all to do with um, the direction, the wind taking uh, moisture, get, getting trapped on one side of the mountains and not being able to get to the other. So what I might do is I might have some trees coming down this side, hugging the river. The river could go through this forest. Uh, I might even decide to make this area a bit swampy. Maybe some race could live there that likes a more wet, um, swampy marshland sort of place. And then this area would be more dry. This could be more um, grasslandy, possibly even a desert if that's what you wanted to go for. But then it would be a very cold desert because we're in the north. I love this island here. I think that's perfect for some form of settlement. I would have said that this one would be as well, but if this is going to be the setting of our volcano, which I'm actually going to put the crater of the volcano there so that we can see that. It'd be really interesting to find out in our next episode what we come up with, uh, whether there's some sort of uh, civilization that maybe worship the volcano. Maybe is it linking in with their belief system? We're going to be looking at that in a few weeks. Um, do they harness the volcano for some form of magic or for some sort of uh, method of their living, like their agriculture uh, or technology? There are so many different ways that that can go. But as you can see, we are starting to build up that map. Um I'm going to leave that there for today because I think the next step is going to be deciding on our races, where they're going to live and where and what we're going to name those settlements. So our map's starting to come together now. Next week, we're going to be adding some human features to our map, some settlements, some other things made by man to really sort of flesh it out and start creating a history rather than just a geography. 
Don't forget to subscribe, it really helps out the channel, and leave a comment down below. Tell me what your favourite fantasy map is, from a novel, from a film, or a game. Tell me what you think. So, until next time, I have been McClellan Moorwood, this has been the Fantasy Workbench, and I will see you in the next chapter.